Introduce himself a little bit more, and uh, we've got a. Uh, no, you can. Okay. You know how to do these. Morning, things. everybody. Morning. It's great to be with you. Last time we were here, it was very different weather. It was the first Sunday in Advent, I think, and there were Christmas decorations up. I think there was like an inflatable like snowman thing in the corner. Was that right? Something like that in the, in the corner. And so um, it's great to be back. In uh, great to be invited back, and we're, we're pretty local. We're in. We're in Leighton Buzzard, so, so a relatively quick journey for us. And as Jess has said, I work for the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, uh, who are based in central London, and we travel all around the country trying to convey a message about being a disciple everywhere. And as has already been said, if you were here last time, um, or if you're new, my name is Ken Benjamin. I'm here with my wife, Sue. And one of the things that we try and do as an institute, as an ICC, is to try to encourage Christians in the bit of their discipleship, the bit of their journey that is everywhere, that is in the whole of their lives, Monday through Saturday. And we do that in a number of ways, with talks and with books and with videos and with some songs. And I wanna play you a song now for all ages, for young and old. So if the children can listen up and watch as well, that'd be fantastic. And um, if you can just, say afterwards if you're up for contributing if there's something in the images or something in the words either or that jumped out at you and spoke to you it's a sort of a story and it follows three different characters you have to watch it quite closely to, to kind of get the three different characters i'm really hoping the video works now after giving this build up <laughs> but we'll see if it does it did in rehearsal and it's, it was written quite locally it's written by a friend of ours uh, called andy flanagan in luton so it's written just down the road, but it's, it's been shown all around the country and it's part of a, a big national initiative called Thy Kingdom Come um, coming up in uh, a couple of weeks time. So let's see if this works. We are not made for the harbour. This God at risk exposed You lift our eyes to horizons Where that heaven crushes earth And this worn world is transformed We are not made for the heart We are made for the sea Though at times it's wild and cold and dark It's where we're meant to be And launch us out as a fight Though we may be tossed about But your presence in the storm, it walls us in, calls us out. You sent us out to the market, sent us out to the fields. Jesus, hope ambassadors. We take no purse for the journey, but take your authority to declare that all is yours. Your presence in the storm, it walls us in and calls 
Okay, there's a lot in there, isn't there? And you could watch that several times and see see different things. And there's no right or wrong answers. But do shout out if there was a like something in the images, something in the words, something in the three characters that are repeated there that jumped that jumped out at you, that spoke to you, that you noticed. Anyone? Yeah. I, I like the phrase in the song where it says, um, it, the presence walls us in and calls us out. Yeah, yeah. They seem like like a paradox, like yeah, yeah, that in and out mix. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Calls us in and calls us out. Walls us in and calls us out. Okay, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Any any other thoughts? Yes. Yes. Where, where, say that's last. Where it's all out for us. Where it's all out for us. Yeah. So you've got three characters there. Did you notice the three? What are the three? Yeah, some sort of council office, mm -hmm. some sort of factory, warehouse type thing, and a school school situation. And all of them not necessarily easy. Yeah. What else did we notice? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so at times it might be cold and dark, but it's where we're meant to be or something like that. Yeah, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I love, love, love that line. Yeah. And I felt like there's, there's a kind of like, a, having mentioned the Holy Spirit, there's a kind of Holy Spirit moment, isn't there, where these dots kind of come into the person to help them in their difficulty. And that isn't necessarily just a church thing. It happens wherever we find ourselves, in the places that we find ourselves. That's a good and encouraging message too. One more, if there's one more from anyone. I love the bits where the council officer stood, where it came out of a chair and stood in the middle of my face. Yes. Uh, beautiful. Yes. So um, do have another look at it, play it another time. You can download just the track to play it as a, as a church if you want to. But that's what we're all about, from young and old, all ages, Wherever we find ourselves, we're called to represent him well, to be his followers uh, throughout the Monday to Saturday, as well as on, on Sunday, in the places that we find ourselves. Paid employment or um, if we're retired, if we're not in work, for whatever reason, the places we spend most time, particularly thinking of spending most time with people who don't yet share our faith. So I pray that there'll be something in that for all of us as we go into this week. Thanks, Jess. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, we are going to um, take up an offering in our next song. Now, I know lots of people give in different ways, so we're not counting the money from individuals or anything like that. Just be a blessing in whatever way God is leading you um, to give this morning. And if, if you wanna let the money bags pass you by, go for it i do every week so um let's um <laughs> i know i know i know <laughs>
Um, and we're going to have a worship song now. We might not know this song so well, but it's got some beautiful lyrics in it. It's about God, do it again. Come and visit us. Come and be with us. Uh, come and lead us. So let's stand and worship as we take our offering. Never 
Mike and I uh, just say how lovely it is to be here again. It's really good to, to join you again. We've got two really short readings and both from the book of Hebrews. So the first is Hebrews chapter three and just verses 13 and 14. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. And then if you just move on a bit to Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us not consider how we, sorry, not a not, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Have you seen this before, this image? Some of yes. you have? Okay, so let's reiterate it. But, it. but did you make the connection with your logo? Maybe you did as well. Your logo's got six, got grey dots and red dots in Mark Cape Baptist Church. And here are some grey dots and red dots. So it's, it's 100 dots altogether in a square there. Those 100 dots represent the population of the UK. The red dots represent the Christians. And so there are six red dots on your logo and in our image. And they are those who identify themselves as Christians and attend church in person or online at least once a month. That's not a particularly high bar, but let's go with it. And so we can have this view of church that we are together, we gather together and we encourage one another, as those verses in Hebrew say, and we try and have some influence over the grey dots around us. But for the majority of our lives, the majority of our weeks, the image doesn't look like that. The image looks like this. We're out and about. Still the same number of red dots, but like that song, we're not made for the harbour, we're made for the sea. And so we're out and about making so many more connections with those who are not yet Christians, trying to encourage them where they are. So we can, when we're here, try to encourage people to join us. That's a good thing. But for most of the time, we're joining with them, wherever they are. And so we've got red dots on our banner here as well. If you see from that other image there, you can probably just about <coughs> see a banner to my right, if you're watching online. And I want us to think about one thing in particular today, which we don't often emphasize when we talk about these dots. When we talk about these dots, as LICC, we often say what I've just said, which is that we have so much more influence we have so much more time when we're out and about. Here's what we don't say. When we're out there, out and about in our various frontline places, those places where we spend most time, particularly with people who don't yet share our faith, it's scarier than when we're here. It is harder to have confidence when we're out and about than when we're gathered. It's easier to sing a little louder than live a little bolder. And yet we're called to live a little bolder. So what would it look like if we try to create and encourage some faith confidence in one another when we're together, such that we have that confidence when we're apart? And that's why we brought those two readings from Hebrews. There's a lot that we don't know about the letter to the Hebrews. We're not sure of the audience, really. But the reason it's become known as the letter to the Hebrews is because all the way through the letter, it kind of assumes that the audience know the scriptures from the Old Testament, particularly the first five books of the Old Testament. And so because of that, we assume they're Jewish Christians, and so the letter to the Hebrews. There's three other things you should bear in mind whenever you open the letter to the Hebrews. One, it was a difficult time to be a Christian. So if we're thinking about people in Eritrea or in other places in the world where it's difficult to follow our faith, it was a difficult time to follow our faith. And we might find, to a lesser degree, there are difficulties for us following our faith today. Secondly, because of competing ideas for 
what, what is most important in, in people's lives. The letter to the Hebrews keeps trying to say and point out how Jesus is superior to anything else or anyone else that's around. And the third thing that's going on in the letter to the Hebrews is the writer is trying to encourage people to stay on track, keep going with this faith thing. It really, really matters. And in order to stay on track, the writer does a number of things, but one of the things the writer does is he or she rep repeats the phrase, one another, one another, the things that we do for each other. And that's what I want us to think about today in terms of confidence as well. So I don't know whether you noticed that, but that was in the two readings that Sue brought to us. So encourage one another daily, every day. That's quite a command. Like stop there. If you do nothing else from this sermon, but work out actually you're supposed to encourage one another daily, and we do that, that would be fantastic. But I've been given more time than that, so I'm going to go on for a bit. The second reading says, and let us consider how we, we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. But there's at least two others in Hebrews as well. So Hebrews 8 verse 11 says, no longer it looks to a time when we'll be with Jesus. No longer will we need to they teach their neighbour to say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest, which means that we're supposed to go on teaching one another from now on, from, from the moment, to know the Lord. And then right at the end of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 1 says, keep on loving one another. So it deliberately repeats that phrase. So here we are. It's harder to have confidence in those places. And yet, and there are a whole bunch of things that can knock our confidence today. And yet there are some things that can really genuinely help build your confidence. And I've been writing some thoughts on this for a Lent devotional study for LICC that you can get next Lent if you want for, for free. It'll be a new version. It'll be a daily email from us if, if you would like that. And we've developed kind of six thoughts from which, which we think are biblical thoughts that can help build your confidence. And so here they are. Confidence grows, our faith confidence, when we're out and about when we're convinced. If you know why you believe what you believe, then even if you might feel in a minority, wherever you are, in the school, in the workplace, in the leisure place, among your neighbours, among your family even, then that will help you to have confidence. Confidence grows when we're convinced. Confidence grows with the support of community. If we have the support of one another, then we will, even though we feel more alone, we'll know that we're not alone. And that will help us grow our confidence. Thirdly, confidence grows when we have compassion. If you have enough heart for Jesus and for the people that you spend yourself with, that even though you might lack confidence, your compassion will drive you to do the right thing. And so compassion wins over, over lack of confidence. Confidence grows when we have consistent patterns. So, well, the microphone dropped then. It's back again now. Um, if we have, um, it might be the battery. If it does, I'll go to this one. So if we uh, have consistent patterns of prayer and devotion for ourselves, then our confidence will grow there too. Two more. Confidence grows when we have enough competence. So sometimes we lack confidence because we think, I just, I wouldn't know how to answer that question. And then yet, if we do feel we've been helped to begin to answer some questions and we know where to point people to if they don't, or we know some people who could help us, then that will help us to have confidence. And confidence grows when we have some resolved courage. So sometimes confidence doesn't just happen by just kind of whipping it up before some, we go for something. Sometimes you just have to make a bold gulp, gulp go for it moment. And in the process of going for it, confidence grows. Now I've rattled through those for a reason because I'm now going to ask an impossible question which is and I know at least one of you was making notes so you could feel smug now at this point, <laughs> which is that it is really hard to remember six things like almost impossible but all of those began with CO I'll give you that as a heads up so I'd like you to turn to the people that you find yourself sitting with Unless they don't look very wise, then pick somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and, and you know, if you're a row behind, join the row in front and, and see how many of those six COs you can remember. If you can remember three, you're doing well, right? So confidence grows with. Let's, let's have, a, have a little chat. So folks, um, let's shout one out. What have, what have we got? Anyway, let's keep going until we've got as far as we can. Courage, okay, so confidence grows with courage, yeah, okay, or with, um, you might have worded it as commitment, I can't remember what the slide said, but with committed courage, yeah, absolutely, yeah, thank you. Confidence. With conf, well, conf it's all about conf, conf, confidence, so yeah, so, you know, that's, that's, that's a good umbrella title for them, yeah. Compassion. Compassion, yeah, we said that compassion kind of wins over from lack of lack of confidence. <laughs> Consistency and competence. <laughs> Commitment was the kind of courage one, yeah. Community, Community. right? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, was there one right at the beginning? The first one I have. Convinced, absolutely, when we're convinced. So let's have a look at that again. So confidence grows through being convinced, through supportive community, through cultivating compassion, through daily consistency, to developing competence, through resolved courage. Now, imagine this is a 40 day reading thing, we wouldn't have time to go through them all today, but let me give you two or three in a little bit more detail so that we've got something to go away with. If this is you, if you recognize this thought of lack of confidence when you're out and about. Now, some of you won't recognize this thought as well. It's worth saying that. So some of you, you just have no problem at all with confidence when you, for your faith when you're out and about in the rest of your week. No problem at all with talking to people about Jesus. No problem at all with kind of this resolved courage thing. I would just ask you to bear in mind that some of the people sitting next to you, they might not feel the same way as you. That in this room, some of us lack confidence. And also this isn't a personal character confidence thing. You might be the sort of person who's just confident walking into a room saying anything to anyone. But this is, you might not be that sort of person in character, but you, you, we all need to have this in our faith. So this is not like a, a kind of self-confidence, not an arrogant confidence, but a kind, humble confidence that looks and feels like Jesus. So the first of those was confidence grows through being convinced. And that's one of the things the writer to Hebrews wants people to get. So I know that I'm more convinced if I can think through for myself some of the reasons and then carry those reasons into the places when I'm in a minority with my faith. Pick this image of abseiling. I've done abseiling two or three times, not very often. But if you're hanging there on a rope, I like some reasons to be convinced that the rope is going to work. And so I like, I'll ask some questions before I do it. So I'll ask sort of half jokingly, so, so how strong is that rope? And if they so tell me it's, it's, strong enough to, to carry a small car, then I know I've put some weight on over lockdown, but I feel okay with that. That helps me to be convinced. I'll ask them again, half jokingly, if they've done this before, the instructor. And if they have, that helps me to be convinced. And if they haven't, then I'm probably gonna walk away, generally. I'll look and see where the anchor points are for the rope, and if they've got good knots on the anchor points. And if all of the equipment looks reasonably new, all of those things help me to be convinced then. And if somebody else has gone first, that really helps as well. And I think that helps me to be convinced too. Similarly, with my faith and with your faith, it's good for us to know why are you convinced? Because we're talking about faith in an invisible God, aren't we? Most of the time, it's good to just think about that. I'm convinced because I look at the world and I see enough evidence more than enough evidence of a creator God, a designer God, actually. I'm convinced because as a minister, I've had the privilege and honor of being with people right at the very end of their lives, as they 
breathe their last breath sometimes. And when I've done that, I'm convinced that that's not it, that there is more and that more is eternal. I'm convinced because also as a minister, I've been with people very soon after they've had new life, a, a baby, not straight away, that'd be weird as a minister, but a little bit later on, soon after they've had a baby in a maternity ward, for example. And I'm convinced looking at that baby that there is more than the sum of the wriggling parts. Yes, <laughs> beautiful, and I'm cute. There is a soul there, and that soul points to a creator, God. I'm convinced most of all because of Jesus because his words and wisdom and life and death and resurrection are like nothing else. And they've worked across 2000 years and across cultures. Part of my culture is from Sri Lanka. That's where my dad was from. And I've learned, I've had the privilege of being in different places in the world. And I've learned that some of the stories I tell, some of the things I say, they don't work across cultures. Some of my jokes don't work very well in Malawi or Sri Lanka or Kazakhstan or places that I've had the privilege of going to. But the message of Jesus works across cultures in an amazing way. And that helps me to have faith. I'm convinced most of all because of the resurrection of Jesus. I've looked as best I can at the evidence and I find it compelling. I'm convinced because of the life of those first disciples, actually. Because they either did or didn't see the risen Jesus. And they were prepared to stake their lives to it. Most of them, it cost them their lives. And yet they were committed to it. I'm convinced because of the difference it makes in somebody's life when they become a Christian, and I see that. I'm convinced because of the difference that the power of the Holy Spirit still makes in people's lives today. I'm convinced because of the example of some Christians that I know. To be convinced doesn't mean certain, it just means that I've got more than enough to go on with this faith thing when I feel like I'm on my own with those red dots apart. So it's good for us to know why we are convinced, because that will help my confidence. That will help your confidence. And your list might be the same as mine, borrow any of mine, or it might be different. But to know now, when we're those red dots together, why we're convinced helps us when we're apart, even if apart means with your family this afternoon, or in the leisure place that you will find yourself in, or in your school tomorrow, or in your workplace tomorrow, or in your leisure place. The second of those really does strongly relate to this idea in Hebrews. Confidence grows through community. Here's the thing. Part of the reason we lack confidence is because we feel more alone when we're out there. Part of the answer then is that we're not alone when we're out there. We have the promise of God to be with us. The promise of Jesus to be with us always, all the days. We sometimes have other Christians, other red dots not too far away from us. We might go to different churches, that doesn't matter. They're people of faith with us. If they're slightly different shade of red, that's still fine, isn't it? They're the people of faith with us who we should encourage and be encouraged to. And we have the command here in Hebrews to encourage one another daily and to find ways of spurring one another on. The word translated in carried there in Hebrews 3 verse 13, parakaleo, is a compound of two words, para and kaleo. Brilliant. So para is like parallel, as in to come alongside, and kaleo is to call to action. So what this means is, if we're to encourage one another daily, it means we're to find ways of coming alongside each other and calling each other to action to represent Jesus well. I'm not just talking about talking about Jesus. Sometimes we have the opportunity to do that. But in, in words and deeds to represent him well. Now, more than any other time in history as Christians, we have the opportunity to do that for one another when we're out and about. Some of you are making notes on your smartphones as we speak. The generations that have gone before us, we'd have gathered together on a Sunday, you could have written a letter to each other during the week, you could have posted something to you, you could have phoned them when they were at home, it might not have been appropriate to phone them in the workplace, 
Now you can drop somebody here a WhatsApp message. You can text them. And depending on their workplace, they may open it live there and then they may open it on their way in, they may open it on the way home. To encourage, to come alongside and to call them to action. To say, I'm supporting you, I'm encouraging you, I'm praying for you in this situation that you find yourself in. And if we know that we're doing that for one another, it helps give us confidence. It helps grow our confidence in the places that we find ourselves in. Let me give you an example. I'm going to change his name, but the rest is true. Greg used to work for an environmental consultant company that worked with in the aggregates industry. <clears throat> but his thing was marine aggregates down on the south coast. Big companies would want to dredge the seabed to get gravel for the construction industry. But before these companies could do that, sucking up the gravel, they're legally required to have an environmental assessment done. Enter Greg, that's what Greg does. So he goes diving to do environmental assessment. At a certain point in time, at a certain location in the sea, certain companies wanted to extract an incomprehensible quantity of gravel. The companies were essentially saying that the consequences for the fish and for the crabs and for all the creatures will be minimal. And Greg's job was to do the research and find out if that was true. Except for Greg is getting pressure from this company to find out that actually there's, you know, please find out that there's no real negative impact. Except for Greg is a Christian. And he does this research and he finds out actually there is pretty bad negative impact on all of the marine life. So he's got a dilemma now because he knows his job is at stake. He's sort of sensing that. And he believes that our God is a God of creation. We should look after creation. And anyway, he should do the right thing as a Christian. He should say the right thing. So what does Greg do? Well, he prays, but he also gets encouragement from his family who are Christians and they pray for him. He gets encouragement from his church because he shares it with his minister. He gets encouragement from his small group, his home group, who, who are there with him in the sense of dropping him a text and saying, we're praying for you. How does this story end? Well, badly and then well, because Greg does hold true to his convictions. He doesn't lie. He does produce this report that says that the impacts are going to be negative. He does lose his job. His family go on praying for him. And after a time, Greg gets another job, a better job. One that he prefers, one that he does feel called to. We have the job, as long as it's called today, to encourage one another daily, to spur one another on towards love and towards good deeds. Last one I'll just mention briefly. Confidence grows through compassion. We might feel that we lack um, confidence for various things, but if we have something of the love of Jesus grow in us when we're together, when we're worshiping, when we're praying, sometimes we can't help ourselves but do, do the right thing. Think of parents on Father's Day. Think of parents in Ukraine, for example. They might have any number of reasons to be nervous. And yet, in order to protect their children, they will do the brave thing. So compassion wins over lack of confidence. Do you, do you remember Top Trumps? Anybody old enough to remember Top Trumps? I'm not on my own here, this game where you get different categories. Well, if there was a category called emotions for, for human beings, compassion, a lot of compassion, trumps lack of confidence. And you cultivate compassion by contemplating Jesus, by worshipping our God, by asking God to give us more of his heart, more of his heart to do the right thing. In the story of the Good Samaritan, when the Samaritan does stop, for the end of the story, I'm going to not tell you a whole nother sermon, but you know the Samaritan does stop and care for the person who's been left abandoned and beaten up on this path from Jerusalem to Jericho. 
he stops and, and he says he has compassion. He says he has this heart level compassion deep within him. Splagnodzimahi in the in the Greek. It's the it's only also used for the the father in the prodigal son story. So even though he might have any number of reasons not to stop, any number of reasons to be nervous, because we're the bandits now anyway, he stops because compassion trumps lack of confidence. So, so for today, that will do for us, I think. Confidence grows through being convinced. No way you're convinced. Confidence grows through community. Your confidence is partly dependent on those around you, and theirs is partly dependent on yours. Confidence grows through compassion. Where are we? I hope we're in a place where we can see that we can help grow one another's confidence. We know that we need that. We're in a new town learning to new fellowship with new people and we're learning that we need other people around us to help build our confidence. Pray for us as we pray for you. When we, when we sing our final song, there's, there's something that you could do if this is appropriate for some or all of you to kind of seal the deal on your confidence and, and on this frontline thing is to, is to join with other churches. We've had this banner since Sue and I've been traveling just for a couple of months now, since, since March, in fact. And uh, we've taken it all around the UK, uh, Sunday services like, like this one. And people have taken a Sharpie pen, there's some on the table there, and they've named their front line. So it might be the NHS or the school game. Don't worry if yours is already there. Write it again if you want to. You might have to put your hand behind it because it's just a sort of floppy banner type of thing. Uh, don't name yourself, just name the banner. And then during the singing of that song or during coffee if you want to do it afterwards, um, pause long enough to read somebody else's. Some other Christian somewhere else in the UK who's going to go back to that front line probably tomorrow. And, and pray for them, would you, would you do that, if you feel able to. Also, on the table, when you look at the Sharpie pens, there is a sign-up sheet. If you would like more information about LICC, we drop a free email every Monday, looking at God's Word and applying it to God's world. We drop a free email, that's called Word for the Week, a free email every Friday called Connecting the Culture looking at what's going on in the world and trying to connect it. You can get those for free and you can sign up for more information from us. And there's just a handful of uh, some books we gave out. Um, you can still buy them, but those ones, the remaining ones are free. Uh, celebrating the Queen's Jubilee and her faith. Looking particularly at her own statements of faith from the speeches that she often gives on Christmas Day. So if those are appropriate to you, just take one for free. I'll hand back to Jess. Thank you, Ken. Um, yeah, I just want to, to encourage us to participate in what Ken's just suggested. So bring our, um, our frontline places up here as we sing, as we worship. And, um, and let us be thinking of how we can encourage one another uh, and continue to do that. It might be that we need to just have honest conversations um, and ask people, what, what are your challenges in your workplace or amongst the people that you talk to. Anyway, let's, um, let's sing and come up as you feel ready um, and add to this uh, amazing range of things here. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God Of the goodness of God. 
Of the goodness of God.